and I've got a testimony. God has been good to me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank God for all of you that came out this morning and are joining us uh, even later on YouTube, what have you. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord. It's good to see you. Praise God. And, and like was said, as was said earlier, uh, it was, it's amazing to see the, the, the praise and the worship go forth from our nation's cap, capital uh, yesterday because God promises to hear uh, the cries of his people. And I, I remember uh, uh, Abraham said, you know, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah deserved the punishment. But he said, for 10 righteous folks, would you not spare them? And God said, for 10, I would. And the park rangers said that there were about one million people on the mall of our capital praying, crying out to God that God spare this nation. And I heard some amazing statistics. They said, during the Revolutionary War, only 3% of the entire colony population fought against the British. There were another 10% that contributed finances, clothing, shelter, whatever, to those 3% that were actually doing the fighting. But there was 36, 37% that opposed those wanting to separate from uh, Great Britain. They actually fought with the British. Th can you imagine? 37% of our nation's or the colony's population was siding with the British. And there was another 50% who were clueless as to what was even going on. As long as I get dinner at 5 o'clock in the evening, my favorite show, come on, that's all I'm concerned about. But they said the statistics are about the same today. There's about 3% of the nation who's actually actively fighting for the salvation of this nation. There's another uh, uh, 7% or 10%, I, I got the numbers wrong, 10% that is supporting those 3%. I, I see those 3% who are actively praying, crying out, worshiping, interceding for God. And there's another 10% uh, that shows up at church and, and they bless it and, and they a, amen what they see going on. But there's 30 uh, seven percent out there that's actively uh, conspiring against the mission and the mind of God. I read an article in the Huffington Post. I don't often go there, but someone told me that there was an article there, and I couldn't believe it. It was a a, 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 a normal so-called Christian woman said I was you know brought up in a Christian home, and uh, but then she said she began to read what the Temple of Satan espoused. And, and she said, you know what? I believe with everything they said. Those, those, the temple of Satan isn't so bad. And she said, don't, don't confuse the temple of Satan with the church of Satan. They're, they're evil. But the, <laughs> the temple of Satan folks, the uh, Satanists, they're okay. They believe that you know, women should have the right to kill their unborn fetuses. They, sh they believe that you could live any kind of lifestyle uh, you want uh, as long as you don't harm anybody. You can live all kinds of promiscuous life. And she's saying, you know what? I believe that. They believe that you should uh, worship uh, uh, nature and protect it and revere it above uh, your own life. You see, I, I, you know, I believe all of that right there in the Huffington Post well-known website for news. And I said, wow, is that the mind of the average person today? It's, it's, it's just insane what has been going on in our country. And I find that the voice of the church has been marginalized. People used to look to the church and say, what is the church saying? What is God saying? But now it's been marginalized. Amen. All right. I don't want to go into editorial, which I could easily do. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, verse 49. We have just come through Rosh Hashanah. Somebody said uh, during the time of Rosh Hashanah, 10 days, uh, that's when the Jews believe that uh, essentially let it be written. Whatever you confess during those 10 times, you confess your sins. They believe you're to confess your sins and make things right with God. Whatever you confess, let it be written. And then on the day of Yom Kippur, which is today, which happened at six o'clock last night, uh, it is said, the Jews say, let it be sealed. All those things that you've confessed and prayed for during the past 10 days, the days of atonement, the days of awe, uh, today is the day it is sealed now for another year. So I hope you made some good confessions. 
Praise the Lord. All right. Luke chapter 2, verse 49. And Jesus said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? I'm going to stop there. You know what? I meant to go back and, and print out the rest of that chapter, but we'll stop there. Uh, today, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to talk about our founder. Uh, it is Founder's Day. And, uh, and then I'll give you a little sermon at the end of that. And, and we'll go on uh, worshiping and praising the Lord. And today I gave for a title, The Family Business. The Family Business. Jesus said, uh, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? The fact that Jesus said the father's business implies there must be other businesses. He narrowed it down so that you wouldn't be confused. He said, I've got to be about my father's business. And some of you may or may not know the history of our, our, our founder, our, the Blaine family. But let me just uh, tell you, uh, way back at just after the turn of the century, uh, there was a man, Nixon Blaine, who married uh, Mamie Blaine. And together uh, in the early 1900s, pre-World War I, uh, they came together. And, and, and from that union came five children, uh, four boys and one girl. But then Nixon deserted the family. And this woman in the South had as many strikes against you as you could just about have. She was black. She was a woman. She was uh, in the South. She was uh, not officially divorced, but separated with five children that were depending on her to provide for them and take care of them. And, and it pushed her. She believed in God, but it pushed her to seek God like never before. She was out of desperation. She sought God and she messed around and got filled with the Holy Ghost because she sought God. And a few other folks in the region, the community, uh, got filled with the Holy Ghost as well. Uh, and they found that the, the churches of the area were not tolerant of those Holy Ghost filled folks. So they got together and they formed a church there in uh, the Sand Ridge in South Carolina. And they got together and formed a community church and they called it the St. John's Church of God, Glorious United Pentecostal Church. Amen. Wow. Woo. <laughs> three of these sons, I don't know about the other children, but three of the sons got filled with the Holy Ghost and they became known as the three Blaine boys. And they would go around the area starting fires, revival fires, that is. And, and, and they would worship, didn't matter how many folks were there. And it was said that you could hear them worshiping, hooping and hollering for up to two miles away, banging on their washboards or whatever it is they could bang on, sticks, walls, floors, whatever they had. They made it re worship and, and rejoice and, and praise God. And they, through their ministry, their worshiping, they would travel by foot, by bicycle, by mule, I don't know, by cart, by wagon. Uh, uh, and they would go about, you know, 30, 40 miles uh, radius, just going out worshiping and, and evangelizing and preaching the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. And they saw signs and wonders and miracles. And, and, and uh, our founder's father, Arthur Blaine, one of the three Blaine boys, uh, uh, had a special anointing to heal babies that were sick with what was called thrash by blowing in their mouths. Benny Hinn didn't start blowing on people. Uh, it was my grandfather. He was blowing in ba people, babies' mouths and they would be instantly healed. And people would line up to have my grandfather, our founder's father, blow in their mouths. Black folks and white folks during the Depression and beyond. And I remember as a small child, my earliest remembrance of him, I never forget, uh, I must have been four or five years old. We had traveled all day to get to South Carolina, and it was pitch black outside, no street lights, and walking up to the house with the rickety wooden stairs, and all you could hear was someone moaning and hollering and crying out to God. Oh, God, have mercy, Jesus. 
And that was granddad. That was Arthur Blaine. And he would pray for many hours every day. And sometimes he wouldn't come out of that room, which is right at the front of the house. He'd come in the front door and right to the immediate right was his prayer room where he would be crying out to God. He never went to school much. Somebody said he went to school two days. Somebody else said he went to second grade. I don't know which, but he never learned to read. But miraculously, he could read the word of God. And he knew enough of the word of God to trust it, believe it, and see God work in his life. And he prayed for his 11 children, one of which was our founder, Reverend John Blaine Sr. And out of those 11 children, nine of them became preachers. This became like the family business. All 11 were working in the church, and they were mightily blessed. And I attribute that so much to my grandfather staying in that room before the Lord. He said, when I don't know what to do, I know to call on the name of Jesus. And he was standing, staying there and call on the Lord so much so that his children were blessed and his children were prosperous. And God did a great work. And, and from him came uh, John Blaine uh, Sr., my dad, and God used him mightily. And, it, and he is known up and down the eastern seaboard today for his teaching of the word of God. He uh, taught in Bible school prior to his pastoring and had a class, classes of a thousand students who were teaching. Uh, any, I could go to so many churches up and down the east coast from New England down to the Carolinas, even Florida, and people say, oh, your brother Blaine's son, he taught me in Bible school. And so many can attribute their maturing in the faith due to his teaching. And the Lord uh, called him to start the Philadelphia Deliverance Tabernacle. And, and here we are today, and, and God prospered us and blessed us. And, and we've been up and down and all around, and, and, and God is doing believe today that God is pouring out his spirit as never before, but he's remained faithful. They said, you know what? The average lifespan of a church is about five years. And we've made it through 44 years, through thick and thin, and God is now, we're on the verge of seeing uh, greater than we've ever seen before, greater than we've ever experienced before, because uh, our founder has remained faithful despite what it looked like. God has always provided. God has always made a way where there seemed to be no way. And now here I stand today on the shoulders of giants endeavoring to continue the family's business. So now you know where we come from. It's the family business. Jesus said to uh, Mary and Martha, you know the story. Uh, they came to Jerusalem to pay their taxes and they traveled they said about a day's journey, there was a spot where they would, uh, the people traveling out of Jerusalem would come to rest and, and, and they would do a little socializing. And that's where they stopped and they realized uh, that Jesus wasn't in the mix. Jesus was nowhere to be found. And they spent another day going all the way back to uh, Jerusalem looking for Jesus. And I brought this out on the third day message that it was on the third day that they found Jesus in the temple. And it is in the third day that Jesus is going to revisit his temple as he has never done before. I'm not going to redo the third day message. But she was uh, highly upset. I don't know if you've ever made your mother upset. And I don't know if Jesus got a spanking that day. But he said, how is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business uh, I meant to look up while I was yabbering on. I was supposed to be looking up the rest of that verse. But it said he subjected himself to his mother. He, he, he obeyed her uh, after he'd said, this is what I'm called to do. I'm called to take care of the family business. And I'm telling you today, I, I don't care if you're a Blaine or not. If you are a child of God, if you are a blood brother to Jesus Christ, God is commissioning you and God has called you today to take care of the family business take care of the family business I did cha change the title of this sermon I initially was gonna call it open for business but I didn't want to offend anybody so I'm not gonna talk about those who uh, have have shut down I, I just was alarmed and uh, saddened by someone who told me that 
uh, their church has been closed since March, and not only was the church closed, they were not having online services, they were not having online call sessions. I said, you mean you're not, you've not done, the church has not done anything? Well, they have a time where you can drop off your tithe and your offerings, but we have not had any services because COVID is dangerous, you know, COVID is a killer almost 0.03% of the population is dead now because of COVID. Do you know 3,000 people died this year falling out of bed on Monday morning? But anyway, that's beside the point. And, 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 and people uh, have allowed uh, fear to grip their heart. I'm not condemning anyone. Yes, go ahead, wear your mask, do what you, social distance, do what you uh, uh, are led to do. But we need one another. We need to come together. We need to continue the family business. We need to have the family business open. There are souls dying and going to hell, and they need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. So as I often do, I was going to look up uh, business versus ministry, and I started looking up business, and I, I, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it because I was laughing so much at the first three definitions. Number one was uh, an occupation a profession or a trade. A profession. Our business is all about our profession. What are we professing? And I thought about the difference between a professional and an amateur. A professional is someone who declares, this is who I am. I am a musician. I am an actor. That's what I do. That's my profession. I am a professional. I am a lawyer. I'm a doctor. I'm a professional. That's what I keep professing that I am. But an amateur is someone who doesn't profess that I am that. They just say, I just love doing it. Amor, chore, amor is the Latin for love. I just, I just, I'm not a professional singer. I'm an amateur singer. I just love singing. But God said, I want you to step up and declare. I want you to have the business open and I declare that you're a professional. I am a son of God. I am in the business of Christ. I am in the business of saving souls. And the second definition, I had to laugh at that one. It said, the, pur the purchase and sale of goods in attempt to make a profit. And I keep telling you a profit in the mo they spelled profit wrong, by the way. But uh, I keep telling you a profit in the simplest terms is simply hearing from God and then speaking what you hear. And I believe God told me that we here in the Philadelphia Deliverance Tabernacle, there's two kinds of prophets. There's those that foretell and those that foretell. Well, what's the difference? Well, spelling for one, since someone jumped on me last week about my spelling. But anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, one who foretells is one who predicts what is about to happen. That's one kind of prophet. But there's another kind of prophecy or prophetic word is one that foretells. One that determines the future by their words. And I've explained this before. Uh, one that foretells says, you know, if you continue down Broad Street, keep going, you will hit City Hall. That, that's one who foretells. I, I see it. Uh, by the path you're going, you're going to hit City Hall. But one who foretells says... You could just randomly drive around the city and you're going to hit City Hall because I have declared it. I have stated it. Uh, I hear people saying we've got to uh, declare and decree and, and we know that God has called us and separated us to be kings and priests. Uh, anybody can make a declaration. Anyone can declare a thing. Praise the Lord for Sister Clay coming in the house. Amen. Anyone can declare a thing. Uh, you, you all hear the, the, the hillbilly, I declare, and they say, and they, it's simply stating something. It's putting out in the atmosphere, and that's what God tells us to do. We're supposed to declare a thing, and, and it will uh, be established. But what kings do, they decree a thing. In other words, when they say something, it becomes law. How many of you have ever seen uh, uh, the Ten Commandments? And you'd see Ferris, he would, Pharaoh, not Ferris, Ferris, that's a different movie. Uh, Pharaoh, he would declare a thing and said, so let it be written, so let it be said, so let it be written. And he would make it into law just because he said it. God said, I've given you that power these days. You can not only declare it, state it out openly, 
But he said, I'm giving you the power to decree a thing so that it will become law. It will have to come into existence. God said, I am making, and in this day, I'm raising up Samuel who will say a thing, and it will come to pass simply because they said it. But God said, I, you've got to get close to me. You've got to have your heart upon my chest like John, uh, the disciple, did. He had his heart, head on the breast of Jesus Christ, so he knew the heartbeat of the Father. We've been talking a lot about the, 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 the mature sons of God. And we, we've seen how businesses uh, get handed down from generation to generation. And one of the things that the, the father or the owner of the business uh, requires of their son is to get educated. Understand the business. I've heard people say that, 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 that before they turned the business over to their son, they made their son do the janitorial work, made the son do the accounting work, made the son uh, uh, do every aspect of the business so he would be intricately familiar with everything that went on in the business before he would be uh, 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 trustworthy enough to be able to take on the burden of the business. God is saying, uh, I'm ready to turn over the supernatural ministry uh, to my sons and daughters, those who are born into the business. God says, get yourself well educated. Get yourself familiar with my word. People want to go out and preach. They don't even know two Bible verses. They know John 3, 16, and they get cards printed up and say, call me to come preach at your church. Jesus said he had two missions, two assignments, and I tell you all the time, and it says, for the Son of Man is come but to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus Christ's mission, his mission statement for his business was to go out and look for those who were lost and to save them. But the second part, he said, uh, John, 1 John 3, 8, And he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For his purpose, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He came to seek and to save that which was lost, and he came to destroy the works of the devil. You know what? I believe that the church, the America, this country is in the predicament it is in today is because we've come in trying to save souls, we, and that's a good thing. Save souls, come in the church and say, you know, buckle up, get ready for rapture. It's going to get a little bit rough, but soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But we forget about it is also our mission to go out and destroy the works of the enemy. I believe that's what was happening on yesterday. They were going out and ripping up the ground, plowing the ground, tilling the soil so that the soil can again receive the word of God. We've taught on Friday nights that uh, Jesus told his disciples, he said, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins are retained, they are retained. And we had, after some discussion about that, uh, we, we concluded that what Jesus was saying, he said, uh, you know, I, I, believe, I believe because of, of the atmosphere, people can't receive Jesus Christ. You can preach at them all you want, but because of the atmosphere they're in, because of the layer of sin they have accumulated on their life, they can't receive Jesus Christ. They can't hear. They can't see uh, the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. But I believe what Jesus was saying, he said, if we remit their sins, we peel back that cloud. We peel back that covering that will prevent them from receiving what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Uh, then, then the Holy Spirit can come right in and convict them, and we can see the most hardened sinners, the most ad, uh, those who are, are most uh, opposed to the things of God, suddenly come and change and come to a realization that they need Jesus Christ. Yes, there are other businesses out there. John, 1 John 3, 10 reads, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. God is saying, I've called you to know the business of righteousness, known that you not only have to get them saved, but you have to destroy the works of the enemy. God says, we, the only way we're going to do this is if we put on the whole armor of God. We've talked about this time and again. We've talked about it even again uh, on Friday night in our, in our, in our uh, discipleship class, the importance of the whole armor of God. Some people think that's, that's what happens when we get saved. But no, I like to point out in Ephesians chapter 6, it starts out, finally, my brethren, 
he's talking to people that are already saved. There are folks that are already saved, but they're not about the Father's business. They're not able to handle the mission that God has assigned the people of God. We've got to be like Jesus and say, I'm about my Father's business every minute of every day. And we've got to, to do this, we have to equip ourselves. I, I, I listed five things we'll go through in just a minute. But, but one thing Dad would always say, uh, uh, our mission is simple. He said, simply, turn right and keep straight. To get people out of their condition, turn right, turn to God, and just keep going, going for God. That's the simplicity of our mission. Our mission, our, our job, our business is to point people toward heaven and to shut down the gates of hell. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the gates. We, we, we not only control uh, the blessing gates, uh, Jesus said that we are portals into heaven. He said the Son of Man will uh, be that portal, that ladder, where angels can ascend into heaven and descend down into the earth. We are the portal through which the glory of God will be displayed and demonstrated in the earth. But he said also that the church uh, has control over the gates of hell. He said, of, upon this rock, upon this truth, upon the knowledge of Jesus Christ, upon learning of him and getting him in you and incorporating his word in you and getting his heartbeat in your heart, then the gates of hell should not prevail against you. You will be able to conquer and, and overcome the forces of the enemy. The reason the, that hell is rampaging in, in America today is because we fail to go out and destroy the work of Jesus Christ. We have this responsibility, 2 Corinthians 5.18, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. It is our job to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, to reconcile them back to God. C.S. Lewis, you may know C.S. Lewis from the Chronicles of Narnia and famous Christian writings. Uh, one of his quotes, he said, the glory of God, and as our only means to glorifying him, the salvation of human souls is the real business of life. C.S. Lewis is saying, essentially, the only function, the only reason we are here still after we get saved is for one reason, and that's to win other souls from God. You say you love God, you know what God loves most. When you love somebody, you find out what they love, and you try to get it for them. You try to do it for them. If they love flowers, you try and find some flowers and get it to them. doesn't matter if you yourself love them or not, because they love it. I want to go out and get what they love because I love them. If you love God, you know what pleases God the most? Souls. If you really love God, you cannot sit idly by with your mouth closed and not tell anyone of the love story of Jesus. They said 85% of, of Christians have never told anyone about Jesus Christ. And they said about 12% of that remaining 15% are, are, are parents who tell their children about Jesus Christ. But outside of that, there's only like 3% that go out regularly and tell people, purposely tell people about Jesus Christ. We have all inherited a family business. Five questions we have to ask ourselves, and I'm done. Number one, we're starting this business. Do we have the best product? Do we have the best product? And that is no question. It's undoubtedly, absolutely, salvation through Jesus Christ is the best product. In I was going to say of all times, but even before time was invented. I was going to say in all the universe, but it's even bigger than the universe. We have the best product beyond everything. Period. We have the ultimate product. I was uh, training to be a salesman at one point, and they uh, had us read this book called The World's Greatest Salesman. And he, the whole time I'm reading the book, the guy said, you're going to like the end. You're going to like the end. And it's telling about sales and all the things he had to do and, and statistics and knowing your demographics and blah, 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 blah. And at the end, it turns out it was the Apostle Paul who was writing the book on how to promote the Jesus Christ. 
So the world's greatest salesman is the one who knows how to package Jesus Christ. See, I've said so many times the world does a terrible job of telling the truth while the world does a wonderful job of telling a lie. Number two, could we market it better to produce more sales or more salvations? Could we market what we have, this salvation message? Could we market it better? And the answer is absolutely yes. And in sales, they say presentation is everything, they say. 1 Samuel 16, 7, part B. We all know this scripture. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And we all emphasize the part that the Lord does. The Lord looks on the heart. He doesn't matter how you look and, and all of that other things. But let me tell you, if you go out witnessing to folk and you have worse body odor than they have and worse bad breath than they have, uh, your presentation is not going to be as effective. We've got to do a better job. We've got to think about these things. We, want, we don't want anyone to slip through the cracks. We've got to consider our hygiene uh, and our presentation, how sloppy or dirty we are. I know some of us, we have dirty jobs and we get dirty. We can't help that. But on the norm, when we're presenting the gospel, and maybe we can do it while we're uh, dumping trash cans in the back of a trash truck, we can still do it then, but uh, we shouldn't go shopping like that, like we've just got off the back of a trash truck. We're to represent the kingdom of God. Is our appearance, or is our parent, appearance uh, seductive as if we are selling more than just Jesus? People of God, I know God is not about dress, but he is concerned about how you affect your brothers and sisters. Be conscious of your appearance. I'm not saying you have to wear makeup and perfume every day. I'm not telling you you have to have Sunday's best on or, or wedding best on every day. But I'm telling you, be concerned because we've got a valuable product on the outside that we want someone to be envious of. We don't want any. I know the Holy Ghost can work through how we look or, or how we present ourselves. I know the Holy Ghost can work through all of that. But like the uh, minister of music was saying, he said, let's worship the Lord to create an atmosphere to make preaching easy. Let's make it easier for the Holy Ghost. Let's not have the Holy Ghost have to wrestle against us, too, along with the spirits that we're, 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 we're talking to or, or, or presenting to. Could we know more about our product? Yes. Education is paramount. Now, I say that with air quotes because of what we're teaching our children in the school systems today. Uh, nobody needs to learn some of that garbage. But we as uh, uh, people who own a business are in charge of our father's business. We have to know about what we are selling. I said I went through sales school and I was alarmed to be coupled up with someone and we're supposed to be selling a product and I'm amazed at what's coming out of this other guy's mouth. I said, man, you didn't even read the material. You don't even know what you're talking about. Listen, some people say I don't witness because they might ask me a question. Some say I don't know enough. I don't know a whole bunch of scriptures. What do you know? You know, I think about when people tell me that, I think about the the man who had a legion of demons, and Jesus came to him, and he cast out that legion of demons. You know the story. And the demons went out and went into pigs, and the pigs drowned themselves. And the man said, Jesus, thank you so much. Let me follow you. Let me be one of your disciples. And Jesus said to him, no. He said, you go out and evangelize. Well, that guy, I'm pretty sure, didn't know a whole lot of scripture. But he went out and did what Jesus commanded him to do. He said, I once was bound, but now I'm free. I once was lost. You know you've seen me running around naked, like naked as a jaybird. You saw me running with chains dangling from me. You saw me eating your cat last night, but now I've been set free. I had more issues in the public library, but now I'm delivered. I'm set free by the powers of Jesus Christ. And it says the next time that Jesus came into that region, 
all of the coasts of the area, everybody in the region came out to see Jesus. I'm telling you, you don't have to have memorized the Bible from cover to cover, but go out and preach and teach and tell what you do know. I heard one mighty woman of God who's a mighty woman of God today. She said when she started out, she just went ever, out to everyone. She said, I've got a word from the Lord for you. Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. That's all. And she said, you would be amazed the number of people who would fall under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit because of that word. Because she just did what the Lord told her. She just used what she had. Last week I talked about uh, uh, Moses and there's something that God told him to do. He said, lift up your rod and stretch it out over the sea. And then he said, lift up your hand. And you know what I said? I said, you know, we talk about faith being the currency of the spirit realm, and it is. It takes faith to please God. But faith doesn't work where there's not an atmosphere of obedience. Moses at that time didn't need sea splitting faith, but he needed rod lifting obedience. In order to use what we have, we have to first be obedient. God said, after you have done the will of God, then you shall receive the promise. Hallelujah. Could we know more about our product? Yes. Have devotions, prayer, Bible studies, assembling ourselves together for all of those above. The number two thing. Will there be hardships and even sufferings? Any business owner knows that there's going to be a rough period. There's going to be a time when the, it seems like the, the debts outweigh the income. What's coming in is not coming in fast enough. And I know a lot of businesses are experiencing now in this whole COVID age. They're on the verge of bankruptcy because they're not allowing enough income to come in to sustain them. There will be hardships in this Christian life. There will be hardship in this Christian business. It will seem like you're talking to many folks and they're not giving their hearts to Jesus Christ. It looks like you're praying for many sick to be healed and they're not being healed. But I again remind you that there is uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. Do what God has commanded you to do. Because he said if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. That's what Jesus said. I need to get rid of that. Hallelujah. Paul says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Know that going into the game. Know that when you get saved, all your problems won't be solved. You'll just have Jesus Christ to be there with you to help you make it through. Onward, Christian soldiers. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Uh, number four. Can we rely on God strengthening us to do his will? Absolutely, yes. Ephesians 3 tells us, you can read this at home, Colossians 1, 11, while rejoicing in trials and tribulations, Romans 5 tells us, God has set in motion the spiritual forces of the universe so that no temptation can overtake us without there being a way of escape provided. He works all things together for our good. Amen. We talked about this on our Friday night discipleship class. I've heard, I've witnessed at funerals young folks dying through violence and other means well before their time. And people will get up in the church, well, you know, it was God's time for them to go. You know, God will work all things together for their good. No, the scripture said it will work it together for the good for those that love him those who are out striving for the accord of his will those are who are working in the will of the lord it's not for everybody and what if you're a child of god and and and, and some hurt or calamity has come in your life well for them it might be a curse because they have refused and rejected and the example in our friday night bible study said so what if this teenage couple get together you know they smoke a little weed they drink uh, a 12-pack of beer and, and then they go out driving and they skid off the road and they're both killed. He said, is that all things working together? Was that the will and the purpose and the plan of God? No. They stepped outside the will of God. They stepped out of the purpose and the protection of God. It's the consequences, as uh, uh, Sister Tony said, of their actions. 
But God will take that situation, if you love God, and work it out for a blessing in your life. God will not cause that to be forever a stumbling block in your life. He will take it and make it somehow work for good if you love the Lord for you. Number five, is there a reward for those about their father's business? On earth, a son about his father's business receives a reward, an inheritance. But a son not about his father's business does not receive a reward. Likewise, those about God's business receive an inheritance, abundant life. Paul says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, but not to me only, but to all them also who love his appearing. There is a reward, not to be confused with the gift. Salvation is a gift. You don't have to do anything to earn salvation, but to get the reward, you have to do something. But the great thing about the reward is you put in a little bit of effort and what you get back is so many times greater than what you put in. It's like I'm not encouraging anyone to play the lottery, but it's you go out and you pay a dollar for your lottery ticket. And if you win, you get the reward thousand time over. Don't play the lottery because your chances of winning are not good. <laughs> Just that I put that in there. But I'm telling you, play Jesus Christ. Put your time in there. Put your effort, your energies in there. Discipline yourself to open up the Bible and get in the Word of God. Discipline yourself to talk to God every day and listen to what He has to say to you. Take the time to assemble yourselves with the people of God. Somebody told me it takes two sticks to start a fire. Sometimes you may be feeling a little dry, but if you get around another dry Christian, you rub together, you can start a fire. Jesus said, where there's two or three together in my name, there I am in the midst. We're talking about the family business. If you're part of the family, God, God said, I'm looking to you. You are responsible to carry on my business. You're responsible uh, to promote my business to the world. You're representing me. We are ambassadors from a heavenly kingdom. If you are the CEO of Chrysler, don't let anyone see you driving a Mercedes Benz. Have mercy. But there are so many Christians who think it not strange to be in perfect alignment, perfect step with the world. They think like the world, they act like the world, they look like the world, they go where the world goes and call themselves a Christian and say they're about their father's business. Not so. When's the last time you've checked in with the father and asked him? I had someone beat me down, was texting me every day, telling me, oh, you shouldn't be voting for so-and-so. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know, stop, stop. I said, well, you're a Christian. Who's God telling you to vote? I didn't ask God. <laughs> Do we have a problem here? In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. I'm not condemning you. You go with whoever God tells you to vote for. But I tell you, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then the blessings will come to you. Stop. Why is it, why is it uh, Christians can't see? They walk in lockstep with the world. They, they're in total agreement with, with the LGBT community. Uh, sin separates us from God, but God made a list of things that he abhors, the things that he cannot stand, that are abomination. And two of those things is, are uh, things that are, are often talked about in, in politics today, and that should make it so easy. He said, he hateth a man that sheddeth innocent blood. I don't know of more innocent blood than the unborn. They have never killed, robbed, stolen cursed, sworn, lied, cheated, anybody. But their blood is so in a, uh, haphazardly shed and, and discarded as if there were nothing. And then the other thing that God said he abhors is man sleeping with a man as though he was with a woman. 
Romans chapter 1, he said he's given those up to a reprobate mind. And we went through that. First we think, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just being promiscuous is okay. And then we think that, you know, homosexuality is okay. And then we get to the point where the man says, it's okay if I'm a woman now. God says, not so. I cannot release. I cannot turn over my business to someone who is walking in lockstep with the world. I cannot turn over my business to someone who is buying products from the other opposing competitive business. God said, I'm looking for someone who is sold out to this business so that if I go into your house, all I see is products from your business. Well, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> uh, let me leave it alone. We have a responsibility to keep our business open and prospering. Our job is working not only for, but with Jesus every night and every day. I'm just going to read this and I'm going to quit. It's not a popular message today. I'm not talking about just the Blaine family business. The, 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 that, and I, I'm blessed today because of generational blessings stacking one upon itself. I'm blessed because great great grandma prayed and fasted and was dedicated, sold out to the Lord. I'm I am blessed and highly favored because my grandfather went around reviving doing revivals and singing and praying and all hours of the night and day. I'm blessed because my father taught us to pray at a very early age, continually. Every uh, time I remember him praying for us, he said, protect them from childhood sickness and disease. And because of that, I had perfect attendance. And I said, why is it in the, everyone else gets to take sick days off from school? But uh, I had like three sick days in all of my elementary school years. It's not fair. It's because dad prayed, protect them from childhood sickness and diseases. How is it they get to wear that cast and everybody in school comes and sign them and all the teachers put it, oh, what happened? How come I never got any of that? How come I never got any broken bones or had my tonsils taken out, had ear tubes? Why is that? It's not fair, I'm telling you. It's because of the favor, collateral blessings. It's in the DNA. I keep telling you, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God, but the things revealed belong to you, and they belong to your children. If you latch hold to the promises of God, I don't care how old your child gets, they're going to be blessed because you latch hold to the promise of God. You say, Brother John, I don't have a great-grandmother who prayed. I don't have a grandfather who prayed. I don't have a father. Well, you be the start of the generations of the heritage of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are in the last days. You hear that all the time. But let me tell you, we're not going to be raptured this weekend. Not even this week. I don't believe we're going to be raptured before the election. I hear that on YouTube. All Ah, oh, God gave me a dream. We're going to be raptured before the election. Let me tell you, you better make plans for November 4th, 5th. You better start buying your Christmas presents because <laughs> you're going to be here. Hallelujah. You might have an individual rapture, but I believe it's, it's for some time out. And, and it's some, uh, so many people have... have have, have not fulfilled their lives because they're, every day they're thinking, oh, Jesus will come today. No need for me to go to college. No need for me to go to medical school. I've heard these crazy things. You're supposed to live your life as though you're going to live here on this earth the next hundred years, but your spirit, man, is to be prepared as if you're going to die within the next few minutes. That's how we're to live every day. I said I was going to read this and quit. Psalms 81, verse 10 through 16. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken unto my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lusts, and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have been submitted themselves unto him, and their time should have endured forever. 
he should have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey. Out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. When uh, my time is over, do not put that on my tombstone. Because I'm going to see every one of those things fulfilled. When I go into my prayer closet at night, I'm opening my mouth wide. Because he said he would fill it. He said the, the problem was Israel wouldn't open their mouth. I just asked you to open your mouth. I didn't ask you to part the Red Sea. I opened, asked you to open your mouth. God is saying, open your mouth, declare what you would have. Decree, make a decree. You're a king, you're a royal, you're a royal priesthood. And all of these things I'll do for you. I'll give you your heart's desire if you hearken. Them. I'll put your enemies under your feet. I'll destroy that person that keeps getting in your face. We talked about how the children of Israel were, were spared from their enemies. Their enemies were killed. The ones that were pursuing them, not only were they pursuing that day, but God killed them so that they wouldn't pursue them anymore. God said, the enemy that you see today, you will see no longer. God said, if you would open your mouth, stop singing the woe is me. Oh, God, you don't know how horrible I have it. My air condition is broken. It will only cool down to 70 degrees. God, I got a hole in my sock. Now I can't wear my five-inch heels with the open toes. I don't know why you'd wear socks with those. But, um, but we think we have it so rough. But let me tell you, you continue to allow what's going on in the world to go on. If you continue to support those that are promoting such foolishness, you will have it rough. I'm not saying you go to hell, but God said, I've come to give you life. That means he's come to give you eternal life. But if you take control of the business that I have assigned to you, he said, I'll give you abundant life. That's the reward. The gift is life eternal. But the reward is life, abundant life, in this world and the world to come. Jesus said, I'm looking for someone whom I can show myself strong in. I'm looking for someone whose heart is perfect toward me. He said, my eyes are going to and fro in all the earth. Because Jesus said, I'm looking for someone that will be like me. As I am, so are we in this world, is what the Bible says. Someone who's looking to get above the places and the plateaus that they've heard about and that they've known about. I know you've seen some great men and women of God. I know you've seen and heard of great might and miracles. But God said, you have not yet scratched the surface of what I am able to and willing to and wanting to do in the earth. God said, I'm looking for someone to show exploits through. Hallelujah. I'm looking for someone that my power can so rest in them that demons tremble when your eyes open in the morning. They really begin to flee when you open your mouth to speak. But there is a price that we have to pay. You know, some people say, oh, I'm glad that it didn't cost thousands of dollars to get saved. I'm so glad it didn't cost hundreds of thousands uh, uh, to get the Holy Ghost. Uh, I'm glad. You know, but maybe if it did, hallelujah. But God said, no, what it cost is disciplining yourself. What it costs is shutting away with me. I was reading about one of the great revivalists of the day who said, there's so much I have to do today, I cannot help but spend three hours every morning in prayer and seeking God's face. And that is the only way I'm able to get everything done that I need to get done. God says, I'm looking for a folk that will take on the family business. And I will prosper you. I will make your way sweet. Yes, there'll be time you have to go through, but you'll go through the valley of the shadow of death, and in that valley of shadow of death, I'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He said, I'll go before you, and I'll go behind you. I'll be on your right and on your left, and I'll even be down on the inside. And when you open your mouth to speak, don't prepare a speech, but I'll speak through you. To take on the family business, first of all, you have to give Jesus Christ your heart. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you today to accept him as your Savior. It is so simple that, that 
so many theologians have made it complicated because it just seems too simple. They think if they make it more complicated, more would accept him. But all you have to do is say, I believe you, God. I believe that you sent Jesus Christ to die for my sins. And because of that, I received that. And now I am eligible to live eternally with you in heaven. That's step one. Just accepting the gift of Jesus Christ, you become saved. But the very next step, if you want to open the door to all the goody goodies and all of the promises of God, you have to turn away from your sins. You have to repent. I'm rejecting that lifestyle. Oh, but I, 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 I don't know if I can give up uh, uh, my, my cocktail every evening. I, I, I don't know if I could give up cigarettes. God says, come to me first. We'll work that out. We'll work that out. I don't, I, I don't know if I can give up that girlfriend, that boyfriend. I don't know if I can give up that, that, that job that I know is illegal uh, on the down low and, and, and that extra income. God says, come to me first. We'll sort all of that out. He'll give you strength to overcome. He told the Apostle Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient to keep you. You don't need other support system. He said, burn your bridges. Come to me. And I'll save you. I'll welcome you into the family business. Lord, we thank you for all those that have heard the word today. We pray that you till the soil of their hearts. God, we remit their sins that the Holy Spirit can sweep in and do its work and convict sinners of their sins and cause them to cry out to you and save them, God. Save now, God, everyone under the sound of my voice. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you revive us, awaken us, quicken us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we would be all that you'd have us to be, that we would be responsible enough to take the family business. God, we ask in the precious name of Jesus. God bless you. This is the hour of deliverance, and deliverance is taking the land. Until the next time, shalom.